In this lecture, we highlight the first wave of Utah pioneers and their contributions to the built environment. We particularly spotlight Salt Lake City's history in this lecture, and of course, much of this history is unique to Salt Lake. That being said, the larger patterns that underlie Salt Lake's development played out in hundreds of other settlements established by the members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints over the course of the 19th century. Salt Lake's Pioneer Park is often referred to as the Western Ellis Island, and there is little denying its importance in the development of the Intermountain West. Pioneer Park's importance, even its existence today as a city park, is due to the fort that once stood on this site. The old fort, as it has often been called, was constructed shortly after the initial pioneer companies arrived in the Salt Lake Valley. In this fort, the provisional state of Deseret was organized, the valley's first ecclesiastical units or wards were established, Salt Lake City itself was mapped out, and the first schools in the Great Basin launched. The pioneer fort evolved over time. The complex began as an earthen wall that gradually acquired log houses, the first of which utilized clay plaster and log and bark roofs, which supported piles of dirt. This earth-based construction held until the spring rains of 1848 came and melted the clay plaster and washed out many of these dirt roofs. Historical accounts speak of the residents of the fort using umbrellas as protection from the mud that poured down on them from above over the course of that spring season. In the fall of 1848, two additional 10-acre blocks were added to the initial fort structure, which ultimately came to feature about 450 log houses. Many of these later log houses were quite luxurious compared to the early log and mud houses that were constructed at the fort. These later houses featuring luxuries, including wood floors, wood roofs, and fireplaces with clay hearths and adobe brick chimneys. Now, two of these later log structures still stand in Salt Lake City today. I will say a little bit more about them later on in the lecture. The interesting thing about Salt Lake is that its development runs contrary to most cities throughout history which retain the point of initial development as the community center. In Salt Lake, this is clearly not the case. The pioneer fort that served as the city's point of initial development was demolished a few short years after it was built. And by that point, the city had long reestablished its center at Temple Square several blocks away. The complete shift of Salt Lake City's power center from the fort to Temple Square is made abundantly clear in this black parcel map, which shows many of Utah's early leaders clustered around the Temple Block. This unusual recentering of Salt Lake occurred largely because of the document that informed the city's initial development, namely the plat for the city of Zion, which was created by Joseph Smith, the founder of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Designed around principles of community and agrarian order, the plat for the city of Zion called for not just one, but rather 24 temples, which would stand at the center of Salt Lake and other Mormon founded communities. These temples reflected, of course, the central role played by the church in the community, but these buildings were also designated to serve as nodes for education, administration, cultural events, and of course, worship. Residences set on large blocks that encircled the temples, each featured a 25-foot setback from the property line and were designated to be built specifically of brick and stone. The plan also instructed each resident to plant a grove of trees in the front part of their parcels and a garden in the narrow backyard of each parcel. The generous size of Salt Lake City's blocks the city's wide streets, its deeply set back homes, as well as the placement of religious buildings in the center of town, all speak to the legacy of the plat of the city of Zion in Salt Lake City. And of course, this legacy is echoed in hundreds of other cities and towns throughout the Intermountain West, including so many of Utah's other communities. Temple Square was not the only center of power in early Salt Lake City. By 1849, the city's original 19 wards, again, ecclesiastical units were organized. Each of these wards were to be nine blocks each and be led by a leader designated as the ward's bishop. The designation of, of course, ecclesiastical, but also geographic, and for at least a period of time, 
political divisions as wards stemmed from the era in which the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints was headquartered in Nauvoo, Illinois. In Illinois during the 19th century, it was common for communities to be divided into wards for governing. In Salt Lake City, the bishops designated with overseeing each of the city's 19 wards had not only ecclesiastical but also temporal authority and the ward buildings, or rather complexes, eventually erected in each of these sectors of the city reflected the same authority. Unfortunately, only Salt Lake City's 10th Ward retains many of the buildings which not only serve the settlers' spiritual needs, but also their economic, cultural, and educational needs as well. In this complex still remain the original 1873 Meeting House, the Third School House, built in 1887 associated with the 10th Ward. Of course, the late Gothic Revival Church constructed as part of the complex in the early 20th century, as well as the Ward Store, which was built in 1880. It is important to remember that all of these early church complexes represented materials and labor provided by the members of the wards themselves. The ward members were responsible for erecting each of the buildings that served that ecclesiastical as well as geographic unit. As such, these buildings are really true expressions of not just neighborhood faith, but also neighborhood cohesiveness, pride, and economic prowess. In Utah and throughout America, we like to remember pioneers and log houses. Indeed, several dozen of Utah's communities have preserved in their city park or other prominent locale a cabin that, according to tradition, first appeared at or near the community's initial 19th century establishment. Here, for example, we have two images. One shows the dual log cabin, one of the two existing log cabins built as part of the old fort in Salt Lake City, previously referenced. The other photo features the Everett Richmond cabin from 1863, which now stands in a prominent city park in Payson. As previously noted, the pioneers did live in log homes when they first arrived in Salt Lake City and in other parts of Utah, but very few families, however, were satisfied with these log cabins. Very few lived in these cabins for an extended period of time. Hungry for the trappings of civilization, most pioneer families began even shortly after they built the cabins to conceal the crude nature of these cabins' construction under layers of plaster or siding, or they left their cabins when they could for better accommodations. A wide variety of materials were used to build these better accommodations, including in some cases the stone, and here in Utah eventually the brick, that the plat for the city of Zion suggested made appropriate building materials for houses. Adobe, however, proved to be the material that allowed so many of Utah's pioneer families to leave their cabin and build a house that to the pioneer sensibility represented the arrival of civilization in the heretofore untamed West. Utah's adobe bricks were comprised, of course, of mud, but also gravel, some straw, and occasionally other additives, including dung. This adobe tradition in Utah has been traced back to several sources. Some historians have traced the origins of this adobe tradition to 19th century articles that presented the possibilities of mud brick that were printed in Illinois newspapers and possibly read by pioneers who lived in Nauvoo, Illinois before migrating to Utah. The tradition has also been credited to the knowledge that members of the Mormon Battalion brought back to Utah after traipsing through the American Southwest, where of course, for centuries, adobes have been commonly used in construction. Whatever its origins, Adobe for Utah's early pioneers proved to be cheap and durable. Durable so long, of course, as it did not get wet. And this material allowed pioneers to build in Utah, not just houses, but the sort of classically inspired houses that they knew in the parts of America and Europe from which they had migrated. Most of the adobe houses constructed in Utah were relatively simple structures. As illustrated by the beehive and lion houses, both buildings constructed of adobe, mud brick could be significantly dressed up and made into even monumental structures. On that note, however, I should add that many architectural historians have searched in vain for architectural characteristics, especially in the domestic sphere, that are unique to pioneer era Utah. Outside of singular buildings, singular homes, like the Lion House or the Beehive House, most of Utah's 19th century houses illustrate conformity with broader American society rather than any sort of difference 
and division. The practices such as polygamy or other religious customs could have introduced into the architecture. Much of Utah's residential architecture from the 19th century demonstrates an enduring classical influence. Geometrical composition and symmetrical balance were particularly stressed in these residences. Most buildings featured rectangular facades, flat, rhythmically punctuated elevations, and centrally situated doors. Exterior details changed over time, and a variety of architectural trends came and went with the years. Yet the overriding concern for symmetrical design and classical decoration remained constant in Utah from the late 1840s until the mid to late 1880s. Where Utah's pioneer generation really used architecture to emphasize any difference they had from mainstream America was through the four temples that were constructed in pioneer Utah, starting with St. George in 1877 and ending with Salt Lake in 1893. These buildings, singular in both their form and plan ranked among the most architecturally conscious buildings constructed in pioneer era Utah. These temples acknowledgement of architectural fashion in terms of both their exterior detailing and interior fittings elevated the buildings structurally and consequently distinguished them in terms of their purpose. What makes these buildings particularly interesting architecturally is that none of the architects who designed any of these four structures had professional academic training, save Joseph Don Carlos Young, a son of Brigham Young, who only contributed to the Salt Lake Temple towards the very end of that project. What these architects were able to accomplish with so extraordinary little to work with is truly remarkable, and therefore these architects deserve their place in the pantheon of great Utah architects. As always, we end our lectures with profuse thanks for those who have donated to Preservation Utah and become members of our organization. It's thanks to you that we are truly able to fulfill our mission to educate and advocate for Utah's historic built environment. We encourage all of you to consider donating this month, particularly because your donations will be matched by Abstract Masonry, who has kindly provided their financial support to help make this Preservation Month a success for Preservation Utah. Thank you. Thank you.